Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss um, uh, this uh, difficult topics. I think for most of the people, you probably hate it, uh, but I guess uh, hopefully this will be helpful uh, for, uh, especially for resident uh, when you get called Friday afternoon or uh, middle of the night. Um, the, there are three types and uh, uh, the most common is of course the ischemic uh, type of priapism. Uh, the other one is non ischemic. And the third one is called the stuttering. And I'm going to discuss uh, one by one of the different types. The ischemic, by definition, uh, the uh, corpora carbonosa is ischemic. Uh, uh, in fact, it actually doesn't have any inflow or outflow. And after hours, you use up all the oxygen and it becomes uh, quite ischemic. And when you draw the blood out of the corpora, and this is what kind of color you can uh, expect. And I like to start with a case presentation. Uh, this is an interesting, but it's a difficult one. And so I'd like to uh, share it with you. This is a 30 year old uh, young man uh, who actually only took one trazodone for insomnia and then developed a priapism. He was kind of uh, uh, shunned uh, and uh, didn't really seek any medical treatment until about 48 hours later. He showed up in a local emergency room uh, uh, in a community uh, center and uh, they did an aspiration and injection of dilutive to a phenylephrine. Now, this is not exactly the case. This is one of our residents uh, masterpiece. Uh, he draw so much blood out of this uh, uh, patient's uh, penis. Uh, this is actually not necessary. I hate to say that. Uh, all you have to do is take out about 50 to 70 cc of blood. The penis becomes soft and then you inject your phenylephrine. There's no need to draw so much blood. And usually phenylephrine, we only inject about 250 to 500 diluted phenylephrine solutions every uh, probably two to three minutes, uh, that will be good enough until the penis is soft. In this particular case, let's go back again. Uh, they did uh, twice, the aspiration and the uh, phenylephrine injection and uh, the prepping recurred. So they brought the patient uh, to the OR uh, and did a winter shunt. However, next day the patient had a Prapism again, so they took him back again and did a uh, Eberhardt shunt. So even then after the procedure, the patient had a recurrence, and the next day they gave up, they uh, tra transferred the patient to us. Our resident um, took the page, patient and uh, decided to uh, talked to the uncle attendant and brought to the operating room and did a tea shunt with dilation. However, the next day the priapism recurred and it persisted. So finally they called me and we took the patient to the operating room. But instead of the, the repeat the tea shunt and dilation, we also give anticoagulation. And we'll talk about that in more detail. Next morning, the penis was completely soft and the patient was discharged. So this is a very interesting case because this is 10 days. However, he, ha he does have inter uh, interventions almost every other day. So the penis was not uh, terribly ischemic. So that's a very important point. So what is the outcome? The patient returned four weeks later and we did a cardio duplex ultrasound and excellent blood flow was seen in both cavernous arteries. He reported nocturnal erections six weeks later and was able to have sexual intercourse three months after the episode without any PD-5 inhibitors. So he was lucky. 
Now let's just talk a little bit about differentiation. I think most of you know how to take care of the, how to uh, make the diagnosis. Ischemic by definition, uh, there's no blood, no circulation in the penis. Therefore, the penis is rigid, very painful. The cause are usually drug induced. That's the most common, uh, especially the intracavernous injections. Uh, but you can also have the parapidin uh, due to sickle cell disease or trait or thalassemia. The non ischemic, in the majority of cases, are due to penile or uh, perineal injury. The penis is usually not uh, rigid, uh, usually it's partial. It could be from somewhere on 50 to 70, 80 uh, percent erection. Now, if you take a blood gas out of the corpora, the ischemic is hypoxic. The non ischemic, of course, is not. Color display ultrasound in is non ischemic, you'll see a good blood flow, but not the ischemic type. And the treatment for the ischemic type is urgent because you don't want to have a ischemia lasting for too long, uh, but the non ischemic is not. So let's talk about what is the mechanism of the ischemic priapism. A lot of them, except the drug induced, a lot of them are actually uh, patient just had a good nocturnal erection and wake up in the morning, erection continue and doesn't want to get down. And so what makes the normal erection turn into a priapism? So let's just review the mechanism of a uh, uh, venous outflow uh, system. Uh, in the flaccid state, the uh, subtunical plexus uh, usually are uh, open, so the blood goes in and out without any problem. Of course, the blood flow is minimal. During erection, when you have a lot of blood flow going to the corpora, it expands the whole system, the penis become longer and bigger. The expanded sinusoid actually literally push the venous channels, subtunical venous channels against the wall and that shut off the venous outflow. So on the uh, left lower side, you see the uh, tiny little venules joined together become a mystery vein uh, and then cut, goes through the tunica right here. In the erect state, you see the compression of the venous channels. Uh, this is the study we did uh, quite a few years ago uh, this was uh, in the uh, uh, dog a penis, but when, it, when we did some uh, uh, studies in the monkey and also some human fresh cadaver, uh, we saw the very similar structures. So we believe this is the mechanism of uh, penile venous compression during erection. So let's go back to priapism now. What are the causes? As I say, most of the time it's from injection or overdose of uh, PD5 inhibitors or uh, psychotropic. And the mechanism is a little bit different, but the common pathway is relaxation of the cavernous smooth muscles. Now, if we talk about sickle cell, uh, it's a little bit different. It's really from hemolysis and then uh, depletion of nitric oxide, which uh, cause um, microvascular thrombosis. Now, if relaxation of the smooth muscle lasts too long, then the penis become ischemic. And then you also had a decrease, temporary decrease of PDE5 protein, as well as decrease of raw A and raw kinase, which will prevent the smooth muscle from contracting. And then the next step will be paralysis of the cavernous muscles. Um, and once that happened, then this part become irreversible. In other words, the penis, the muscle cannot contract, of course, this will continue and then you have the ischemic uh, priapism. This is the cardiotopic ultrasound just showing the uh, lack of blood flow in the cavernous artery in the ischemic type of priapism. Uh, and the right side just shows the excellent blood flow in the cavernous arteries. If the priapism is 
within uh, is less than 24 hours. Uh, more than 95% of the time, you should be able to get it down with aspiration uh, of the drainage of the uh, uh, old blood, and then I give dilutive phenylephrine solutions because the muscle can still respond pretty well to the uh, uh, diluted phenylephrine. But once you pass 24 hours, the muscles are much less responsive. Uh, quite often, uh, or the majority of time, you're going to need to do a shunt. Shunt, the idea is nothing new. Look at the two papers published in 1964 uh, by Quakers, Calvinoso Spongioso Shunt, and by John Grahak in Chicago, Suffering Spain to Calvinoso Shunt. They were published in 1964. And the idea is that if there's no blood flow in and out of the corpora Calvinoso, this is the death space now, but you have persistent uh, blood flow in the glands, the dorsal vein, as well as the spongiosum. So you can make shunt uh, from the corpora to those uh, structures. And that's the idea of the shunting to reestablish blood circulation. So just briefly, 1964, John Grahak from uh, Chicago, uh, he uh, basically used the softening spin to do anastomosis to the corpus calvinosum to drain the blood. Uh, Dr. John Berry in uh, Oregon uh, modified that and uh, used the uh, dorsal vein or the penis. You can use a superficial or the deep dorsal vein for that purpose. Dr. Agarab, uh, he uh, is uh, he was uh, at the University of Alexandria, Egypt. He developed the Agorab procedure in the 1960s by uh, open surgery uh, to um, find the uh, tip of the corpora cavernosa and then just uh, cut the tip of the corpora cavernosa so you can establish the blood flow uh, to the uh, glands. The distal shunt, um, the first one was uh, uh, beside Dr. Uh, beside the Agorab. The other more modified one uh, were published by uh, Eberhoff in 1974 from Copenhagen. He, a, he was a plastic surgeon and he used a uh, knight, uh, fitting, uh, fitting braid, a sharp knife uh, to create the, the shunt. 1976, uh, Dr. Chester Winter in Ohio um, popularized the winter shunt by using the bioptic, uh, biopsy needle to make uh, several passes to make the uh, a shunt between the cavernosum and the glans penis. And then the uh, Cavernoso spongioso shunt by Quakers in 1964 and 72 by Sacker. Uh, just to do the anastomosis between the uh, spongiosum and the uh, uh, cavernosum. We uh, modified the procedure um, by just uh, making, a, making things a little bit different, uh, making a bigger shunt and try to avoid the uh, proximal shunt by doing a tunneling. And uh, so this is how we did it. Uh, you pass a, a 10 blade. So this is much wider than a 15 or a 19 uh, blade. And you pass a 10 blade longitudinally go from the glands to the corpus calvinosum. Uh, when, it's, when you have a priapism, you have a soft glands and a hard corpora, so it's easy to find the tip and just go right into it. And then you turn it outward 90 degrees and pull the knife out. So that make a T-shaped um, shunt. If the penis becomes soft, then that's it. 
But if the penis is still hard, then you do the same thing on the other side. You cannot do the shunt when the penis is soft. It's dangerous because you may puncture the sponge also. Uh, if it's less than 48 hours, I think that's all you need. But up to 48 hours, then we have to do a little bit more. We make a tunnel by using a uh, sun, a straight male, uh, female sun, just pass through from the distal to the proximal to create a tunnel. So the blood can go from proximal to the distal part of the penis, because by that time there's so much edema, even you create a shunt, the blood may not be able to go through. And so that just a, a way to um, replace the, uh, the proximal uh, shunting procedure. Uh, such as the, uh, the spongy also shunt. Uh, Bud Bonnet from Hopkins uh, popularized this in, 19, in 2013. Uh, basically just uh, do the, the same uh, algorithm procedure, but then uh, uh, surgically uh, open up the glands, uh, cut out the tip of the copra, and then pass the snail to create a shunt. Now, we, after looking at this shunt, we think that we have done a great job, but uh, the truth is not. Uh, we still see the recurrence, and so there must be something wrong with all the shunting procedure. As sometimes I happen to read, read an article and uh, it mentioned that exposed collagen is the most powerful initiator for blood clotting in vivo. Although we know all the different factors uh, in the coagulation cascade, inside the body exposed collagen is actually the most important uh, initiator. And then if we look at how the penis how the copra carbonosa is structured. Look, you have a tunica of junior, which is about 1.5 to 2.5 millimeter. So think about that. No matter what kind of shunt you do to the glands, to the spongiosum, to the dorsal vein of the penis, you have to go through a 1.5 to 2.5 millimeter distance without any endothelial covering, which means that the um, when you do a vascular anastomosis, you know it's very, very important to do a good endothelial, endothelial anastomosis so you can uh, keep the anastomosis open. But when you do a shunt, you violate this principle because the moment you create a shunt, you expose the collagen to the blood. And so the blood clotting uh, gets started uh, immediately. And therefore, if you do a shunt, probably with a small shunt, probably within an hour or two, it may get clotted. If you have a bigger shunt, it may just take it a longer, maybe six hours or maybe 12 hours, or by tomorrow morning, it may get uh, clotted also. So honestly, that um, help us to design a different way of uh, treating priapism. So let me give you the result first. Uh, from 2008 to 2019, we had 70 patients with at least one acute priapism episode uh, come to our uh, hospitals. When we did aspiration and phenylephrine alone, about 40% of them had a recurrence. Now this is the all comers. So we're not talking about the, we, we didn't specifically look at the duration but when patient receive aspiration and phenyl, aspiration phenylephrine injection plus anticoagulation, none of the four develop recurrence. Now the number is small here, but it probably <laughs> it actually suggests that this could be helpful. But more importantly for those people that had a shunt, 13 of the patients that had the shunt 
only again uh, all kind of shunt with them at that time, uh, almost 70% had recurrence and need an additional procedure. But the nine patients that had a T shunt plus anticoagulation, only one of them had a recurrence. And this patient was taken back uh, and did it again with coagulation and the parapetum completely resolved. Which means that somehow with this approach, we can definitely uh, prevent the recurrence. So this is our uh, algorithm now. When the patient come in with a history of physical examination, indicate an ischemic parapetum, if it's within 24 hours, we do the evacuation of all blood and keep diluted phenyl alpha uh, adrenergic agonist phenyl epirin, uh, usually about roughly about 500 microgram every two, three minutes until the erection goes down. If fail, of course, we go to the next step. Or if the patient already passed 24 hours, um, most likely we're not going to be able to get it down anyway. So we may sometimes may I just go directly to T shunt and anticoagulation. If the patient is over, the prepping is over two days, then we'll add the uh, tunnel in uh, just to make sure we have uh, the blood can go from the proximal to the distal penis. And with this approach, we've been very lucky uh, almost more than 90% of the time we can get it down at the first uh, trial. If fail, we just bring the patient back in and do the procedure again. So almost uh, every one of them we can uh, take down the uh, private, except, except if the private is already four, five, seven days, that may not work. We may be able to get the erection down, but we probably uh, cannot uh, save the erectile function. So that's a difference between resolving parapetism and uh, uh, we preserving the erectile tissue. Now, what kind of anticoagulation we use? Uh, once we know we're gonna take the patient to the uh, operating room or we're gonna do the shunting procedure in the emergency room or uh, even at the bedside, we give them uh, aspirin first and then give a shot of uh, subcutaneous uh, heparin, 5,000 unit. Then we do the shunting procedure. Most of the time we do the T-shunt with or without tunneling, depends on the duration. And then post-op will give the uh, baby aspirin and Plevex 75 milligram for five days. You don't need to go any further than that because otherwise you may create a permanent uh, shunt. And as I said, we've been very successful with this approach. And again, that just tell you that the peri, uh, shunting procedure anticoagulation is, is very important uh, in, uh, in the shunting procedure or in preventing recurrence of a private. I should also mention that, let's go back to the case. It's 10 days, but he had almost some sort of intervention uh, every day or every other day. And the ischemia has never uh, last, uh, lasted more than uh, 36 hours, really. And that's why he was able to recover the erectile function completely. So what determined the outcome of erectile function is really the, the longest ischemic uh, duration. So if you do the uh, aspiration, phenylephrine uh, irrigation, or just even just aspiration alone, you sort of establish uh, some blood flows, fresh blood flow to the penis, you turn the clock backward, uh, start over again. And so even after 10 days, uh, he can still recover the function because he didn't really have a very prolonged uh, ischemic uh, uh, situation, uh, not more than 36 hours. So that's why the patient recovered completely. Of course, if the patient already had erectile dysfunction or 
the oral patient may not be able to recover uh, like that. Next topic is the non-ischemic priapism. And um, again, I like to start with the case. This is a young man, 26 years old. He likes to do the uh, skateboard, skateboarding. And uh, unfortunately, he had a little accident, like what you see on the right-hand side, just landed with a, uh, uh, right in the uh, perineal area. Now, at the time of injury, he actually didn't see any erection. Uh, it was kind of painful on the butt. However, next morning, he woke up in the morning and he had a 70% erection that persists and just didn't go away uh, for seven days. Although he tried to have sexual intercourse a couple of times, but was not successful. So after seven days, he uh, showed up uh, in our clinic. For high propriapism, the majority of cases are due to blunt perineal or penile trauma. This is very, very typical. The onset of priapism is usually delayed until nocturnal or sexual erosion blow out, literally blow out the injured arterial wall. And I'll show you some of the pictures later. So here, this is the caudal duplex ultrasound. The left side is in the diastolic phase, the right side is in the systolic phase. So if you look at the right side, you see the artery right there, and there's a branch just rupture right into this cystic cavity. Uh, the top is a longitudinal view, the bottom is the transverse view, and this is in the uh, cruise of the penis. Now on the Diastolic phase, you see a little bit more clear. It's, it's a branch that broken into this cystic cavity. Now, why it's a cystic cavity? Because you have a damage right in there and the tissues are damaged. Uh, the artery rupture right into this place. So after several days, the tissue, the damaged tissue was clear. So you had a literally a cystic cavity within the corpus. Calvinosum. Now this shows a little bit more clear. Uh, here is a cystic cavity. This is a branch. Uh, in this particular case was actually the major cavernous artery was broken and the blood just continuously pumping into this uh, cavity. The cavity is literally a dead tissue, spongy tissue that was uh, clear up, cleared or washed out by the keep pumping of the blood into this cavity. So it's a full of blood uh, in this damaged uh, area. This is a, another case, but it's not a major artery. It's just a small branch that is, was broken. Now, the traditional teaching is to do an angiographic uh, embryization, uh, and uh, sometimes people even do bilateral embryization. Uh, there are a couple of problems with that. One is if you do bilateral embryization, uh, the patient may become impotent uh, permanently. Uh, the second problem is that when you do put a coil or a blood clot and the patient has a nocturnal ration, the arteries opens up, the clot may just get washed off the coil may also get washed off. In fact, uh, uh, there was a report of coil that uh, got washed out and uh, lodged in the lungs. And the success rate of this kind of procedure is probably only uh, 50%. So we are, we are kind of disappointed. And then uh, when we think about what we can do, and we also know that this condition most of the time happen the next day after a nocturnal erection. So that gave us an idea. If we uh, take away the nocturnal erection, there's minimal or even very, very little blood in the cavernous artery, then we may be able to uh, 
heal the problem, heal the injury. So we decided to give a trial. And this is just a report showing that when, you, when the testosterone level is very, very low, you have very little uh, nocturnal erection. So taking uh, advantage of this, uh, we decided to start to give patient uh, anti androgen and see what happened to the patient. So this particular patient, of course, we have a number of them now, but this patient was given anti androgen a ketoconazole of 400 milligram at bedtime and Castodex 5 milligram daily for one month. Uh, we use this, uh, we like this uh, because it works right away. If you use uh, something called like a Lupron, it takes much longer time to work. Three weeks later, Carter Dupre also, also show a one centimeter fibrotic area at the previously noted cystic area. Patient reported 80% erection at six weeks. He had a complete return on normal erections and sexual function about eight months after the injury. Now look at this picture. This was uh, after three weeks and the cystic cavities was gone. And what you see is a fibrotic area with a blood flow, blood vessel is already repaired. Uh, so the damage, the damaged tissue, uh, the area become fibrotic like that. And because this is very close to the uh, cavernous nerve as well as the cavernous artery, uh, this is of course not the main artery. So it took almost uh, uh, eight months to, uh, for the patient to uh, recover completely his uh, normal function. So we have quite a number of patients like this. So now we don't, uh, we very rarely uh, use the angiographic uh, embryonation. The uh, androgen abrasion therapy seems to work quite well, uh, especially if they come in uh, early in the case, in the course. So here is what we do with a diagnosis by Carter Dupre's ultrasound. If the main cavernous artery, uh, no matter actually no matter whether main cavernous artery or Harrison artery, we're going to give androgen abrasion therapy. If the small artery uh, rupture, most likely it's going to be uh, cured. Uh, it may just take a little longer for the for the erection to recover completely, uh, but within several weeks. Uh, the rupture artery will, will close by itself. If it's at the major artery, it may not work completely. We may still need an angiographic embryonation. But as I say, embryonation only gives you a 50% success rate. So we would like to also give angiogen operation. I think with this approach, uh, we should have a very, very high uh, opportunity uh, to, uh, to shut down the uh, the rupture artery and uh, uh, for the patient to recover. How, however, in some patient, if it's a very long duration, for example, I had a patient from other countries that had a high flow platform for three years before he came to see me. And he had a, like a 70% erection all the time, all day, all day long for three years. In that situation, this particular approach may not help and so we, we, I actually did a surgical repair. I have done that uh, several times, but you have to wait at least seven months or so for the pseudo capsule, capsule to form. Uh, so you can just do it also intraoperative ultrasound, just aiming right into the pseudo capsule. Once you find the pseudo capsule, you open it up and you see a pumper uh, and just put one stitch to take care of that pump. So that's what I, I've done several times. Uh, I made a mistake to go in uh, earlier, like within two, three months, because uh, uh, a colleague of mine kept asking me to do that, and that was a disaster. Because if you don't have a pseudo capsule, you open the corpora, you cannot see anything. It's all bloody mess. So you have to wait until the pseudo capsule is, is formed before you can do a surgical procedure. So in conclusion, I think we have a much better way to handle this kind of high pro, high flow pyopism now with 
uh, androgen uh, abrasion therapy. The last part I'd like to talk about the more interest in, in headache. <laughs> the, this is a stuttering practice. Again, I'd like to give, start with a case. This is a, in 2012, a 22 year old man um, with spiritone for in irritability associated with autism. He developed multiple episodes of priapism and was treated by aspiration, injection of alpha agonists and the shunting procedure several times actually. Uh, then eventually after about 30 months, 33 all emergency, emergency room visit, he was referred to us. We then put him on ketoconazole and Lupron and priapism was controlled. However, in 2013, uh, we had to just start, uh, stop that because he, his liver function started to show abnormality because of the uh, ketoconazole and also he had developed painful breast uh, enlargement. It's the uh, painful uh, gynecomastia. So we had to stop the medication. Now let's talk about in general, how do we treat this condition? Of course, if patient shows up in the immune system, then you have to treat it as a ischemic priapism. You give the alpha uh, adrenergic agent or you may have to do a shunt if it's a, if it cannot get it down with a, a phenylephrine. For prevention, you can have several options. You can give a GNH agonist. Uh, usually we give about uh, three to six months. You can give anti androgen as we just mentioned. You can give bacrofen, ketoconazole, prednisone, 5 alpha reductase inhibitors or PD-5 inhibitors as uh, proposed by Dr. Burnett for a patient with sickle cell disease. However, Androgen abrasion can be very helpful because you shut down the nocturnal erections and so the patient doesn't develop private. But in, especially in younger men, you don't want to see a testicular atrophy, loss of libido, energy, gynecomastia, osteoporosis, or loss of muscle mass. Uh, especially in teenagers, definitely you don't want to uh, give the androgen abrasion therapy. So what else you can do? Of course, uh, I mean, theoretically, you can teach a patient to do a phenylephrine injection if it's an uh, older person and it has no problem doing self-injection, but it would be very difficult to teach a young man or a teenager to do that. So what, what caused recurrent priapism? Uh, our, our theory is that it's it's probably due to the imbalance of the contractile and a relax, relaxation uh, forces in the penis. So uh, you have PD5 protein or no epinephrine or some other factors that contract the penis muscle. In opposite, you have acetylcholine or nitric oxide synthase that relaxes muscles. So somehow these two systems uh, it's not, uh, not balanced and you got a problem here. So how do we restore the balance? And that's a very good question here. And out of def uh, desperation, we start to think about the uh, Botox. So we did some experiments in the rats and we find out that if we give good amount of Botox, we can actually suppress the penile erection for a certain period of time. Here, look at three weeks, we almost totally shut down the erection. At eight weeks, there's some recovery. 12 weeks, you have uh, almost 70, 80% recovery of erectile function in the rat penis. And this is a actually uh, erectile uh, curve. You see the uh, normal control you see the completely shutdown erectile function and then gradually recover, almost like giving 
treatment for the bladder, uh, overactive bladder. For the bladder, uh, everybody knows that by giving Botox, you sort of uh, prevent the uh, release of uh, acetylcholine and so the smooth muscle will not uh, contract as uh, much. But in the penis, it's a little bit different because we're talking about nitric oxide. So because nitric oxide is the uh, principal neurotransmitter and the nitric oxide synthesis, the NNAS and ENAS are the uh, crucial enzyme that produce nitric oxide. So here we just show you a standing of NNAS. Those are the red dots next to the smooth muscles, which uh, stands uh, green. We did a photodin stain. And you can see in a normal rat penis, you have plenty of muscle as well as a lot of nitric oxide synthesis enzymes. After we get Botox, we depleted a lot of almost completely depleted nitric oxide synthesis, and therefore the rat could not have erection for a while until uh, gradually the, uh, the nerve endings uh, recover uh, and the enzymes uh, kind of get regenerated. So let's look at back this case again. Uh, in 2013, 2014, again, he developed multiple episodes of priapism because we stopped the medication due to uh, liver uh, enzyme elevation as well as the gynecomastia. So again, he had uh, uh, aspiration, injection of alpha agonist, and the shunting procedure uh, several times. So in, 19, in 2014, 2015, we decided to give Botox 50 to 100 unit uh, injected every uh, two months for a total of six injection. And miraculously, no priapism occurred for three years. So this was a great result. However, in 2018, 2019, Priapism we could, and we have to give another six uh, shot of uh, Botox to control it. In 2020, because of COVID, we could not get the patient uh, in, and the priapism we could again. So he received three more Botox injections, and after uh, up to now, we have not uh, uh, seen any recurrence. Uh, the father actually uh, uh, emailed me. A few days ago, I just told me that the uh, patient's still doing well. He's got some nocturnal erections, but no priapism so far. So uh, I think we are lucky now. We, at least we know a little bit better about the three different type of priapisms. Uh, so to make a, a summary, I think in the ischemic priapism, uh, if we see the patient within 24 hours, we should be able to get it done most of the time uh, with uh, evacuation of all blood, not too much, 50 to 70 cc should be enough, and then give final efferent solution. If it's over 24 hours or more, we most likely we're gonna need a shunt. Uh, even if it's more than 48 hours, we're gonna need a shunting and a tunneling plus perioperative coagulation. Anytime you do a shunt procedure, I think it's very important to give anticoagulation so you can keep the shunt open for at least several days. Uh, usually we like to keep it for five days. And after that, it's okay to, uh, to remove, to uh, stop the anticoagulation and uh, the body already clean up all the uh, uh, toxic or bad substance, and it's okay uh, at that time to stop the uh, anticoagulation. If it's a non-ischemic priapism, I think anti uh, the androgen abrasion is the way to go because we have a number of success with this. Uh, in fact, we have not done an uh, angiographic uh, embryogenation for several years now. The uh, uh, androgen operation uh, was able to take care of all of them. For the stuttering in priapism, uh, you have several choice. You can have uh, androgen operation. You can try PDE5 
uh, that Dr. Burnett suggests in a patient with sickle cell uh, problem. You can teach a patient self uh, injection of phenylephrine. Uh, if um, uh, nothing works, of course, I think Botox uh, can do a good job too. So this is the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions you have. Bye-bye.